last uh, session we have i mean heard a lot about uh, education inequality and also like in this uh, covid 19 situation where uh, we are all uh, depending on the uh, on the digital infrastructure we are also seeing digital divide between uh, within uh, across countries and more so within uh, within the countries and we see that the digi uh, digital divide can actually hinder uh, the progress in terms of uh, economic well-being poverty reduction income transfer social protection transfer all those things so and we have heard uh, mainly from the latin american experience now in this um, in this session we like to hear from uh, asian and pacific um, experiences and we have three very interesting paper uh, to be presented um, by three, uh, I mean, a lot of people, but uh, I think they're all very well known into the NTA network. And uh, this will be, uh, we'll have like two um, uh, designated discussion. I thank them for uh, their time. And they're also very well known to NTA uh, network. And they have been with the NTA, NTA groups for almost a decade. So with that, um, we will have, uh, I mean, one hour. Uh, so we starting around, uh, I think 3.45, so we will uh, like to close it uh, uh, 4.45, um, and we have, like, we, uh, we will allow 10 minutes for each presenter, and then I think five or seven minutes for two designated discussions, and we like to have 10, 15 minutes for Q&E, and then we, that is the way we like to uh, proceed. So with that, um, I'd like to uh, request Professor Narayana to present his uh, paper, the paper will be on inequality, demographic dividend, and economic growth evidence from India. Uh, good morning to everyone there. Uh, it is uh, Wednesday, 5th August uh, 2020 in Bangalore, India. I mean, South India. And uh, this time I am uh, presenting uh, my research on NTA in India on the topic of uh, inequality and demographic dividend and economic growth. Well, we all know a lot about uh, the relationship between the distributional indicators like poverty and inequality and economic growth. The relationship is dynamic and it is uh, mutual inequality affecting economic growth and growth affecting inequality and there is heavy documentation and empirical evidence on such relationship in economic literature i may re i may recollect here the voluminous uh, handbook of the, of uh, income distribution edited by atkinson and others where global documentation of the evidence of the relationship between inequality and economic growth, poverty and economic growth have been documented. But there is one thing that we can add to that literature. Bring in the demographic factors in explaining the relationship between inequality or poverty and economic development. I think that one way of bringing such a relationship through demographic factors is to bring in the concept and the measure of demographic dividend. We have the NTA framework, which actually provides a framework for the interaction of the income and consumption and their inequalities with the economic growth. I'm going to present the way I think how inequality can actually be presented in the context of the demographic dividend and then link with the economic growth, thereby providing a framework of linking inequality with economic development through demographic dividend. And I'm going to produce some evidence based on the Indian data on both income and inequalities and demographic dividend. In accomplishing this basic objective of my paper, I'm, I shall be going to answer four important questions. One, how do I relate the inequalities to demographic dividend? Suppose I have a distinction between income inequality and consumption inequality. 
which one will have a stronger effect on explaining and predicting demographic dividend and what do these analysis analysis actually imply in terms of reducing inequalities as one of the goals of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, especially goal number 10 related to reducing inequality. I begin with this simple slide, which shows the age structure transition from the year 2011 through 2000, 2100. I have four, uh, four, four trends here. One is the share of the population in the working ages, 50, uh, that is from 25 years to 60 years. And also we have young, zero to 14 years, youth population, 15 to 24 years, and elderly population, 60 years and above. It is important to recognize that demographic dividend is closely associated with the rising share of the working population, which is evident here. So throughout the reference period from 2000, 2011 to 2100, we have the share of the working age population above 40% in the total. But it is also important for all of you to recognize that India shall also be aging in terms of the rising population of the elderly and declining population of both young and the youth. So we are very particularly interested to capture the impact of the higher share of the working age population and also the rising share of uh, the elderly population in the context of assessing the demographic dividend for India. Now, let me explain where exactly I introduce the inequalities in the context of NTA based model of demographic dividend. Well, all of us are familiar with this model of first demographic dividend, and I don't think I should uh, spend time on this. So equation one is the familiar um, uh, way of expressing income per person or per capita income, here in this case, income per effective number of workers as a product of the labor productivity and the ratio of effective number of producers to effective number of consumers. In this basic model, distribution of distributional aspects come into picture, mainly in terms of defining and measuring the effective number of consumers and effective number of producers as given here. The distribution is relevant to the distribution of the per capita income profile, I mean labor income, and also relevant for the distribution of per capita consumption by age. So if I can develop a methodology of adjusting the per capita labor income profile and per capita consumption profile to inequality, and if I can plug in, in here, then I may be able to see the impact of inequality adjusted calculation of the demographic dividend. The question is that how do I adjust the income profile and the consumption profile for inequality? Last year, I had the opportunity of publishing the NTA working paper, 19, number two of 2019. There I had proposed a very simple way of adjusting the per capita income and extended later for per capita consumption for inequality using the using amortization's simple aggregate welfare function. So that welfare function has given the framework how there will be welfare losses if inequality exists in the society. So per capita income multiplied by one minus a measure of inequality will give us the welfare losses associated with the inequality. I take that framework into my analysis and adjust the income profile and consumption profile for inequality as shown in equation three and four. So this is the per capita labor income profile and G is actually a measure of Gini coefficient. 
of that distribution by age. Please note that this is not the aggregate measure of inequality. It is the measure of inequality by age because all these profiles are also given by age. So what I do now is I calculate the income inequality in terms of Gini coefficient by age and then use equation three to adjust the inequality and, and calculate the inequality adjusted per capita labor income profile. In similar way, I calculate the inequality adjusted consumption profile as shown in equation four. So the essential point to note here is that using sense welfare function, it is possible for us to adjust the existing NTA profiles for inequality for income as shown in three and consumption as shown in four. Once I have that, what I do is that I redefine the uh, effective, effective number of producers and effective number of consumers with inequality adjusted profiles of labor income and consumption and then arrive at equation five, which is the empirical base for my estimation on or calculation of the demographic dividend. I mean the first demographic dividend. But I am aware about two important limitations in this model of equation five. One, once the inequalities are set at the benchmark level, like that of the profile, they don't change. So there is lack of dynamism of the impact of the inequality on economic growth here. And the second one is that inequality affects economic growth, but not affected by it. It means that we are treating inequality as a determinant, but not as a consequence of economic growth, which is quite different from the classical formulation of relating inequality with economic development, like that of, like that of Kuznets' curve, where inequality was more a consequence of economic development. So kindly remember that I am modeling here inequality as a determinant of economic growth through demographic dividend as shown by equation five. Now, this is the empirical base of my model, and I'm going to explain how I calculate and show the differences quickly. So I have uh, shown how uh, we calculate the income inequality, I mean, labor income inequality and consumption in India by age and in the working paper published last year. And I shall not be elaborating on that because probably that is already known to everybody. Here it was shown for two years. Now I will limit only for the year 2011 and 12 as the BCF for my calculation. In essence, we are using the large scale national sample survey of 2011 and 12, that is 68th round. And uh, we have the total labor income and we calculate the Gini coefficients for age groups and also for individual wages, individual ages. And also I have the consumption data from the 68th round of the national sample survey. And I calculate the Gini coefficients of total consumption per household member uh, using the mixed recall period. I shall come to explain about these measurement details if there are questions on them during the discussion hour. So let me straight away go into the results. Now, the first is the descriptive results. I calculate the income inequality by age and adjust income inequality, adjust income profiles and consumption profiles for inequality. And I get the following results. First is inequality exists in all age groups and there are remarkable differences between them. And income inequality is shown to be higher than the consumption inequality for all ages. And there is also age specific variations in income inequality for the working gap and consumption inequality for the elderly. So it is important to recognize that there are age specific variations in the inequality in both income and consumption in India. And once we adjust the profile, then the profiles will definitely be different and unadjusted one. Let us see how it works. So this is the inequality in per capita labor income across age groups, starting from young, youth, and the working adults and the elderly. And you can see here that in terms of the value of the 
coefficient I mean, in terms of the value of the Gini coefficient, the highest inequality is shown for the working age groups. And also it is important to recognize, ladies and gentlemen, that inequality is also remarkable at the elderly ages. Now, if I adjust the income inequality for the labor profile, I see a very big difference here. This is the, the blue one is unadjusted and this is the adjusted one. And there is a big difference in the, in the, in the levels of the profiles between, between unadjusted and adjusted, mainly because the inequal, inequal, income inequality is quite high in the working ages. In terms of consumption, I'm using a different scale here. Consumption inequality is highest for the elderly and lesser and lesser as we go from elderly to the younger group. And it is very important to know, note that consumption profiles are also going to be remarkably different when we adjust for income inequality as shown by the green line here. So the basic evidence here is that when we adjust for inequality, both income profile and consumption profile are going to be remarkably different in shape and levels as compared to the unadjusted one. Now I calculate the demographic dividend when both inequalities are present and I use the model as I explained in equation number five. What do I get about this? Uh, Professor now, Narayana, just one, uh, yeah. I mean, you have to finish within five minutes. Can you do that, please? Yes, I will do that. Within okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, tell me, uh, kindly repeat the time, time limit. Uh, another five minutes? Hello? Another five minutes? Okay, yes. I will do that. Okay, that is enough you. for me. So when I adjust uh, uh, the when I adjust for the income inequality, these are the basic results I get in the first demographic dividend. One, for obvious reason, inequality adjusted economic support ratios are lower than the unadjusted one. One, I think that seems to be a mere truism, very obvious result. But growth adjusted unadjusted well, growth rate of the unadjusted economic support ratio does not dominate the adjusted economic support ratio throughout. This is very important. And uh, that is going to be the result of a very complex interaction of the age structure transition and then uh, the productivity growth rate and the differential inequality we have in both consumption and, uh, and consumption and labor income by age. So this is how it looks like that. So this is the economic support ratio from 2011 up to 2050. One, if it is not adjusted for inequality, and once it, this is adjusted for inequality, inequality. And it looks parallel, but it is not parallel. But they are different. And now, this is the growth rate of the support ratio. And this figure was just the economic support ratio, and this is the growth rate of the support ratio. And we can see when the first demographic dividend of India ends as we come here. And we can see that the unadjusted income inequality shown on the red is not consistently higher than the unadjusted one. That is mainly because of the age structure transition and the complexity of the interaction that we have. And we have calculated the labor productivity being given at 6.9%. And accordingly, we have calculated the growth effects of inequality adjusted demographic dividend as being shown here. And you can see that the uh, inequality adjusted demographic dividend can also lead to higher economic growth at later years in India. This is a very surprising result. Now I adjust uh, income inequality separately for consumption and uh, and uh, income and see what would be the consequence of the demographic dividend. And there's two simple results are income inequality will have a stronger effect than consumption inequality on demographic dividend and, and on, on economic growth. And uh, this effect leads to lower effect, lower demographic dividend and economic growth. So this is the case. So I adjust only for income inequality and this is the economic support ratio. And I adjusted only for consumption inequality, I get the 
the economic support ratio as shown by this. There's a big difference, bigger than before. And this is quite different from the one we have seen here. When you adjust separately for income and consumption, then there will be a complete domination of the, the growth rate of the economic support ratio of uh, the economic of the economic support ratio adjusted for income inequality. And also it is very clear, unlike before, that the economic growth being higher if only you adjust for income inequality rather than the consumption inequality. So, so the major conclusion of this uh, simple uh, uh, research is the following. Inequalities do matter. They matter not only for distributional policy, but they also matter for growth policy if, and also matter through the demographic changes. So if demography had been ignored in the past, now we have brought in through the NTA methodology and also show how we can connect between inequality and economic growth by this one. The goal number 10 in, in United Nations in UN uh, SDG was is related to reducing inequality. And now it was supportive of the distributional objective. Now this research can support reduction in inequality even from the growth perspective. This is all I have for my research presentation. Thanks. And kindly excuse me if I have overshooted my time. Uh, thank you, Professor Narayana, for a very insightful and a, a new approach to NTA and linking uh, demographic dividend, inequality, and economic growth. And there are quite, um, uh, I mean, new insights in terms of how to explain that uh, uh, support ratio with and without inequality. I mean, inequality adjustment. And I think. That also calls for like uh, what kind of uh, policies um, interventions are required from uh, from the fiscal aspects and other in, in terms of taxes and transfer and that that can actually reduce um, the inequality and then help grow India um, in terms of economic growth and, and then also poverty reduction and inequality. With that, I think the next paper is talks about those things and the Maliki paper is actually looking to the fiscal instrument, how fiscal instrument can be used to uh, reduce inequality. I think with that, I like to thank Professor Narayana and also welcome Maliki for his presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bajlul. And also congratulations to uh, Mr. Narayana. Uh, actually, my uh, presentation will not be as so sophisticated as uh, what uh, Mr. Narayana already uh, presented. Uh, we in Indonesia try to uh, use the NTA uh, as simple as possible because we are trying to give an appeal to, uh, especially to our office itself and then to fiscal office in the Ministry of uh, Finance, as well as the statistical office on how we can use the, <clears throat> the NTA uh, for uh, evaluation program evaluation as well as on how we can uh, 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 draw uh, recommend uh, policy recommendations uh, for uh, implementation of the programs. So uh, let me share my presentation. So as um, our moderator says that we are trying to see how actually the fiscal uh, uh, instruments uh, influence uh, the uh, poverty as well as the inequality and I we are, we are trying to use the NTA approach and uh, I'm, uh, we, uh, we uh, formulate this paper along with our uh, new uh, young uh, colleagues of mine. Uh, here, uh, they are here now, uh, Fiska Olia and also Dinal Karisma. So we try to see uh, how actually the social transfers uh, to reduce poverty and inequality uh, because of the time constraint, I will just focusing on the education transfers. Okay, what happened? Okay. Uh, our referring is actually the SDGs uh, agenda. Uh, we try to uh, reach the uh, zero poverty in uh, 2030, uh, but then we also are directly instructed by the president that we have to achieve the zero uh, extreme poverty uh, earlier than 2030 uh, if it is possible in 2024. 20, uh, the, uh, the only problems of the zero poverty is actually how uh, the 
poor can uh, access to the basic services. That include education, uh, attainment, uh, as well as the health access, uh, the health facilities access. So uh, we try to use the NTA to uh, answer the, uh, the questions on how actually the government policy to achieve uh, the goals, uh, emphasizing the poor attainment, and how NTA can explain the effect of the government policy to the poor attainment. If we see the, uh, the SDGs uh, for uh, achievement uh, in inclusive and equitable equality education. Uh, so if we see from this uh, achievement at the gross enrollment rates, uh, actually at the middle, uh, middle school, uh, middle school that we have quite a uh, high achievement, uh, but uh, at the high school, uh, we still kind of uh, around 80% and it's still quite low. Uh, then our policy to have like 12 years compulsory education for university is still, uh, you know, it's just very far behind. And uh, as well as if we can also uh, analyze between the provinces, I know this one is very small, but it's, it doesn't matter, but we can see the, uh, the, uh, the, vari uh, the variation between the provinces. So there is quite striking uh, differences between, uh, especially in Java Island, uh, and also the Eastern part of Indonesia. So we can see that uh, the enrollment, uh, university uh, gross enrollment rate in 2018, uh, there's quite a lot of uh, enrollment in Yogyakarta, but then uh, it's very low in uh, uh, some part of the eastern part of Indonesia, or uh, also the uh, provinces that have a lot of islands, uh, small islands. And then for the SDGs 4, uh, the, the quality uh, education of uh, lifelong uh, learning opportunities, uh, this is uh, maybe part of uh, also the difficulties of the poor people on how they can also participate on uh, mastering the IT and also the communication skills. So uh, therefore this uh, here is that uh, the proportion of uh, youth and adults with IT and communication skills actually it is increasing at national level, but I believe that this one is because uh, shaped by the uh, Java island performance. And you, you also can see that uh, the variation between the provinces, uh, I know this is very small, but the first, uh, the first two or three or five uh, 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 provinces uh, with a high achievement in the proportion of youth and adults with IT and communication skill is uh, from Java. And as usual, the eastern part of Indonesia uh, is still left behind. So. Uh, we, had, we try to see, uh, I mean, in the full paper, we try to see the inequality not only be, uh, between the economic level uh, of the households, uh, but also uh, in the geographical area. Uh, for now, we are trying to see how uh, actually the, between the poor and the non-poor uh, attainment. Uh, this one is uh, the enrollment uh, rate, school participation. Uh, as you can see that in 20. 12, uh, compared to 2019, uh, the attainment for the poor uh, uh, students uh, increasing quite significant. So here the red part is the poor, and then this uh, solid uh, dark line is also the poor in 2019. So we can see that in every, ages, uh, in every age group, uh, the enrollment rate is increasing. But still, if we compare with the national level, there is still uh, quite a big gap. Uh, not only at the early, edu uh, at the early uh, age, but also at the later ages, especially after high school. So there is a lot of uh, drop rates uh, at the high school, uh, junior high school, and then uh, continue to the high school. Uh, the, uh, the poor have a lot of uh, drop uh, uh, from their schools. Uh, and then we, I think, uh, is still quite far behind at the higher education level. So uh, we can still, uh, that there is a still gap. Uh, this is uh, like a big homework for us for like another uh, three years. If we says that we need to uh, eradicate the extreme poverty, it seems that we also have to uh, improve the access for educations and later for the health as well. Uh, we try to see uh, how actually the, uh, the, the place of residence uh, varies uh, at the enrollment rate. Uh, if in 2019 uh, for the poor uh, is quite a lot, yeah. 
uh, and we try to see how actually the social assistance uh, affect uh, influence the enrollment rate at both uh, urban and rural. Uh, as you can see here, at the urban rate, uh, at the urban uh, uh, level, uh, the poor with the social assistance and also uh, uh, those who uh, receive the social assistance uh, doesn't have any uh, uh, difference. Uh, as uh, maybe we can, I, I can explain that, you know, that not only the poor receive the social assistance because of the inclusion error, so this one is can show that uh, actually uh, this is also uh, show that at the urban level is not uh, there is no uh, difference between this poor and also the social assistance recipients. And then at the rural area, uh, there is uh, some differences, uh, especially if the poor, I mean poor in, in general. So this means that there is some poor that doesn't have or doesn't receive uh, the social assistance. Uh, the enrollment rate is quite low, uh, a bit lower than those uh, the poor with uh, receive social assistance. Uh, but then, uh, in uh, the the those who receive the social assistance uh, in general, not only the poor, is also uh, have a higher enrollment rate, uh, especially at the higher education level. So this is our, our, our first. Um, attempt that uh, we uh, see that actually the social assistance, uh, especially at the rural area, is quite influenced the enrollment rate. But it is still puzzling how actually, uh, why it is not really influenced at the urban uh, areas. Uh, so we go back to National Transfer Account on how we can uh, explain this uh, uh, effect, uh, this uh, phenomena. Uh, to see how actually the uh, education investment uh, influence this enrollment. So we uh, try to estimate uh, education consumption per capita in 2012 uh, compared with 2019. This is the, uh, the uh, this is, no, this is absolute, uh, absolute value, so uh, I don't normalize it. So we can see there is some increasing, uh, I think uh, not only because of the inflation, but also because of the uh, some of uh, new uh, type of expenses of education that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the household have to spend for education. But as you see, uh, the, uh, the, the profile is quite uh, almost uh, the same. Uh, uh, but uh, the, in 2012, we see that in the early educations uh, around uh, like uh, very uh, pre after the higher, uh, after the pre-school uh, age, uh, there is some uh, a bit, a bit uh, increasing uh, cost of education uh, at, at the private level. Uh, but in the other, uh, in the other level, it is I think it is almost the same, especially at the uh, junior or also senior high school. So we can see that uh, the peak is still the same uh, at the uh, uh, junior or high higher education, uh, senior high school education. Uh, Maliki, can you finish yeah. within two minutes? Is it possible to finish within two minutes? Two minutes? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I will try to make it quick. Okay, so it's, yes. this is the poor. The poor household is still struggle in the high school expenses. Uh, still are also the same as in general population. There is jump in their expenses from junior high school to uh, senior high school. Uh, and then uh, we try to see the, uh, the education investment based on the uh, fiscal instruments that we have, uh, which is the social assistance. Uh, we can see there is uh, differences in 2012 between the poor and also the, non, uh, the poor uh, with, with our social assistance. So there is a gap. And then uh, there is uh, some, uh, the gap is uh, diminishing uh, within time. In 2015, the gap is uh, decreasing. And then in poor uh, in 2019 is also uh, diminishing. We uh, further we are trying to analyze on how uh, the inclusion exclusion error we uh, uh, try uh, explain this one, uh, but as well on how uh, actually the social assistance influence the uh, education itself. And then uh, here we see the poor with social assistance. Uh, uh, there is a gap uh, again in 2012 with the poor without uh, social assistance. And then in 2012, uh, it was 2015, uh, there is a gap too, uh, but it is uh, diminishing. 
And then uh, in 2019, uh, poor is also uh, have a gap between uh, those who have the social assistance, but it is not as large as in 2015. So there is some tendency that uh, 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 there is a differences between those who receive the assistance uh, and also those who doesn't receive assistance. And maybe some part of this one is explained by the inclusion error. Uh, in terms of uh, place of residence, we have the differences between the urban and rural. Uh, there is some big uh, uh, gaps uh, in the rural areas. Uh, for those poor with uh, social assistance, also the poor with no, uh, no social assistance. Okay, uh, this is, uh, I, I mean, because of this time concern, we just only focusing on education and still quite half done. Uh, then uh, we are trying to, again, for the analysis on this education transfers. Uh, and how actually the social uh, transfers, uh, social assistance will influence the investment on education, uh, especially in the poor. And then later we are trying also to see the health uh, uh, factors. Uh, for a way forward, uh, now we are trying to see the possible explanation uh, uh, that uh, is due to the same benefit uh, given both in the urban and rural areas, but uh, in the cost of education and its, co its component, are quite different between the urban and rural. And also we are trying to see all again later on how the public investment uh, and also the public transfers uh, will uh, influence this uh, uh, poor uh, uh, private investments on education. I guess uh, that's, uh, uh, that's all from me. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Maliki, for an um, interesting paper where you wanted to highlight the the important uh, fiscal instrument, social assistance, in terms of uh, reducing uh, inequality in the education sector in Indonesia. I think the other two papers of, of these uh, other two authors of this uh, paper is Dinar Karishma and Fiska Aulia. Is that right, Malik? And yes. Yes, I think uh, the, so. Thanks to you and your co-author, and I, th I think that it's also from your presentation. It seems like that you need to uh, enhance your uh, social protection, uh, social assistance in the education sector horizontally and also vertically, and which will require more finances. With that, I think the our third paper uh, looks into, uh, I believe, the fiscal sustainability and e um, and equity in the context of Australia, and they're using uh, the NT of Australia. With that, I'd like to invite James uh, Rice to present uh, their paper. Uh, it's the product of three persons, James Rice, uh, Jeremy Temple, and Peter McDonald. They're from University of Melbourne. Yes. Okay, so I'll be talking today about uh, sustainability and equity in the Australian generational economy. Uh, as you mentioned, it's uh, uh, co-authored work. Uh, although it's still a work in progress, so uh, I welcome any uh, discussion and criticisms. So the paper itself uh, explores indicators of consumption, fiscal sustainability and intergenerational inequality in Australia for the time period between 2010 and 2066 across 72 demographic and economic scenarios, including 24 demographic scenarios and three economic scenarios. Now, so we look at consumption, fiscal sustainability, and intergenerational inequality. And I'll just talk a bit about the indicators that we use to uh, tap those things. So consumption, we look, uh, the indicator is mean per capita consumption across all ages between 2010 and 2066. The indicator for fiscal sustainability is Kind of similar to the consumption deficit as described by Gal and Monastory in a report they did a few years ago. So it is the consumption deficit. Uh, well, what I'm, I'll just call what I'm using the consumption deficit, and it's just simply the present value, the, the present value of aggregate consumption between 2010 and 2066 minus the present value of aggregate labor income all express this proportion of the present value of aggregate labor income. So for the uh, calculation of present value, the discount rate used is 5% per annum. And this measure is uh, intended to indicate the extent to which future consumption is unfunded 
by labor income. So our final indicator relates to intergenerational inequality. And this is maybe a bit more unusual. Uh, the indicator we're using is the IGI index for consumption for the time period between 2010 and 2066. So this is a paper that uh, me and my co-authors have come up with. Uh, and I'll uh, try to describe it succinctly here. So it's essentially, the IGI index is essentially the Gini coefficient for age-adjusted inequalities in consumption across birth cohorts. So it's uh, intended to measure the extent to which uh, different uh, birth cohorts uh, enjoy different incomes or different consumption levels. Now, why should you care about that? I'll just say that um, it's important to realize that uh, which birth cohort you happen, what year you happen to be born in is an accident of birth in the same way that, that uh, uh, things like which race or which sex you're born in are. And I would argue that uh, um, notions of fairness suggest that uh, when it comes to things like your consumption level or income, those things uh, should be uh, as least affected by accidents of birth as uh, possible. So for, if you want more information about the IGI index, you can find it at this working paper. So I will talk a little bit, uh, explain it very briefly. So this graph, this is uh, basically the foundation of the index. This graph is uh, simply a graph of per capita income by birth cohort uh, for across different ages. So it shows how um, per cap how income has changed as different co birth cohorts have, have aged. So what you can see from this graph is that, um, like if you compare different generations of the same age, in general, um, later generations enjoy higher levels of income than earlier generations. So there is an inequality there. Um, now the IGA index is, is, uh, attempts to capture the inequality presented in, in this graph. So the starting point, well, so I'll explain the index. This, if I first say, um, well, the starting point of the index is to look at is to compare two birth two adjacent birth cohorts over the ages for which there's data for both birth cohorts. So, for example, if you look at the the uh, two green lines, the IGA index would be based on the section of the two green lines that overlap the ages at which there's information for both birth cohorts, and uh, using the data for those overlapping ages, um, we come up with we come up with a indicator of the income of one birth cohort um, expressed as a proportion of the income of the previous birth cohort. Now we do that for all birth cohorts. So for all birth, co birth cohorts, we have an indicator of the income of um, one birth cohort relative to the previous birth cohort for this particular time period. In this case, 1981, 82 to 2019. Now, just ch chaining together all of those indicators, you can come up with another set of indicators, which is uh, the income of one birth cohort expressed as a proportion of, say, the first birth cohort. Now, if you do do that, um, then well, once you have those indicators, they can be um, rescaled up or down as you uh, see fit. Now, so. Once you, so this is an example of the, uh, those indicators that are the um, age-adjusted income of birth cohorts relative, in this case, to the uh, age-adjusted income of the birth cohort born in 1915. So you can see generally that uh, uh, age-adjusted income rises with year of birth. So that, for example, um, millennials, you know, in general, uh, enjoy roughly uh, twice the income that uh, baby boomers do. Now that's mostly due to the uh, 40 years of economic growth that separates these two uh, generations. So there is, so you can see that inequality there, and uh, the IGI index is essentially the Gini coefficient for this distribution. 
Okay, so that's, uh, that's the measure of uh, intergenerational inequality that we're using. Now, we, as I mentioned, we look at 72 demographic, uh, demographic and economic scenarios, including 24 demographic scenarios. And uh, these are uh, various uh, permutations of the total fertility rate, life expectancy at birth, and net overseas migration for the time period from between 2010 and 2066. And we also look at three economic scenarios. Now, the first one is um, uh, we assume that consumption and labor income grow at 1.5% per annum. Now, the second economic scenario is what we call the component specific growth, which is that individual components of consumption and labor income. So for example, education consumption, uh, health consumption, and so on. Uh, they grow at the rates at which they grew between 1981, 82, and 2019. So we, we uh, get the growth rates and then assume they continue on into the future. Now, it's, uh, in, it should be noted that between 1981, 82, and 2019, generally, the components of consumption grew by more than 1.5% per annum. So they grew at a faster rate than under the equal growth scenario. Now, while components of labor income grew by less than 1.2, 1 1.5% per annum, so less than in the equal growth scenario. Now, our third scenario is just zero growth, that there's uh, yeah, no growth in uh, labor income or consumption, which uh, is uh, more relevant now maybe than we had hoped. Okay, the data sources used are the Australian National Transfer Accounts for 1980, which we have data for 1981, 82 to 2019. Uh, so the, the data before 2019 is used just to estimate the rates for the uh, uh, component-specific growth scenario. Uh, most of the analysis is really based on the 2009-10 data. Now, we also use the Australian Bureau of Statistics population projections from 2017 to 2066. Uh, that's, the full, that's the full range of the, the latest ABS population projections. Okay, so I'll just talk uh, quickly about some results. So, uh, so th these results will discuss how the various uh, um, um, characteristics of the scenarios affect mean consumption, consum the consumption deficit, and the IGI index. So the number here, for example, for low fertility, um, say low fertility mean consumption is just the mean consumption for all of under all of the scenarios that uh, in which fertility is low and similarly for the medium fertility and high fertility. So what does this tell us about the impact of the total fertility rate on, uh, on these measures? Well really there doesn't seem to be very much impact on uh, mean consumption. Uh, there's a slight increase in, uh, well, as fertility increases, there's a slight increase in the consumption deficit. Now that's uh, probably because of, um, over this time period from 2010 to 2066, there's a, there are growing numbers of, well, higher numbers of uh, young people. And in terms of the, the, well, the total fertility rate has no impact on, um, intergenerational inequality as, me as measured by the IGI index. All right, moving on to life expectancy at birth. Um, life expectancy at birth has a uh, little income, a uh, little uh, effect on uh, mean consumption or the IGI index. It has a slight increasing, uh, higher life expectancies tend to increase the consumption deficit as, you, as uh, might be expected. Okay, finally, uh, well, uh, next, turning to net overseas migration. So we can see going from left to right on these different uh, columns is uh, going from zero net overseas migration, increasing net overseas migration until the high level of net overseas migration. And you can see that uh, as you increase net overseas migration in these scenarios, 
uh, mean consumption tends to increase. The consumption deficit tends to decrease. So uh, there is uh, so these uh, there is uh, more fiscal sustainability, and it has no impact on the uh, intergenerational inequality as measured by the IGI index. All right, finally, the final result I'm going to present uh, relates to the different growth scenarios. Now, uh, I guess uh, comparing the zero growth model to the equal 1.5% growth model, you can see that uh, well, increasing the growth rate um, increases mean consumption. It has a, a slight increasing effect on the consumption deficit and it increases the uh, level of, in of inequality between generations as measured by the IGI index. Now, the component specific growth as compared to the equal 1.5% growth model, you have to remember that in the component, component specific growth model, um, generally the consumption components are growing at a faster than 1.5% faster than and the labor income is growing at less than 1.5%. And so not surprisingly, there's um, large increase in consumption, large increase in the consumption deficit, and also a large increase in uh, intergenerational inequality in consumption as measured by the IGI index. So uh, on the whole, you can see that, uh, you know, um, Increasing growth will increase mean consumption, but it does come at a at something of a cost to uh, inequality between different generations. So maybe that's something to uh, keep in mind if uh, uh, if you're going for large growth to be mindful that uh, if you're interested in uh, in um, consumption being free from the effect of uh, accidents of birth might be important to pay some attention to the, to the difference in consumption levels between generations. Okay, I'm, all, I'm going to conclude with just a uh, few uh, points as to how um, this kind of uh, exercise might be expanded. So one question would be, are there other indicators of consumption, fiscal sustainability, or intergenerational inequality that uh, we should be using? Um, also, the, I mean, I do think that uh, we probably should be estimating more addition, some additional economic scenarios, so additional and a wider range of growth rates, and maybe um, economic scenarios that relate to specific policy uh, scenarios. For example, modeling later retirement and how that affects consumption, um, fiscal sustainability, and intergenerational inequality, or also looking at things like higher female labor force participation, and there's probably a range of other policy specific scenarios that should be modeled. Also, it might be uh, something to consider to extend the range of population projections beyond 2066. Um, I mean, it's possible maybe doing that would, it would uh, affect some of the results presented here. So that's all I'm uh, going to talk about, and I welcome any discussion or criticism. Thank you. Uh, thank you, James, uh, for an interesting paper. I think this paper, compared to the other two papers, is more a forward-looking paper, and they use uh, different kinds of simulation to understand the intergenerational equity uh, for the next uh, 50 years, something like that. And I mean, one of the findings that they have, they have used like a population indicator as well as growth indicator uh, or demographic indicator, to be more precise, to see the their uh, impacts on the uh, IGI. I think that's also important to understand the new concept or the concept they're using. And also in that light, I think one of the outcomes that actually also currently we're seeing that the growth is basically uh, promoting also inequality, although it, it helps higher consumption, but it's also, uh, also I mean, like, uh, it's also promoting inequality in that one. I think it would be interesting to see that the other two uh, simulation that they are thinking of in terms of uh, increasing the uh, retirement rate and also increasing the higher female uh, participation rate. I think, I'm not sure about the participation rate in Australia female, but I thought that that was quite high already.
but I think there is scope for a further increase in uh, higher uh, female participation. With that, uh, I'd like to thank all the presenters for their uh, very interesting and insightful uh, presentation and papers. And I, uh, we have two designated uh, discussions. Well, I mean, uh, they're also from, they're very well known to NTA groups, uh, Professor Lotif Dramani, who is from Senegal and who has been leading uh, like uh, from the African uh, NTA uh, groups and a lot of work on demography. Uh, and he's a professor in economics and economics also. So uh, we would like to hear from him. I mean, uh, and, and the other one is, She's uh, Maria uh, uh, Rivera. She's from uh, El Salvador. She works in UNDP. So we will hear from uh, them. And I like to now uh, invite Professor Latif Damani to uh, give her comments or uh, or his uh, thoughts about this tea paper. Yes. Uh, morning, everybody. Uh, here is morning in Senegal. Okay. okay. Yep. Then um, I go to the first paper. Uh, the paper of, uh, of um, uh, Prof. Narena. I think that is, uh, is a good, a good paper. There are three, three good paper. Uh, I see two, uh, two paper on uh, uh, on um, NTA, uh, NTA uh, model modelizations modeling and uh, one paper which uh, Maliki paper uh, which I just see uh, I just see it now uh, uh, which is uh, a policy paper uh, and uh, for the first paper um, paper on inequality demographic dividend and economic growth uh, evidence from India uh, it's very interesting as uh, it's present an innovation uh, uh, I try to link uh, inequalities, DD, and economic growth. And uh, I have uh, uh, two questions and uh, one and one one or two uh, one suggestions. Uh, the, uh, my uh, um, my question is about uh, uh, clarification clarifications as uh, and uh, as you see. Um, the first question is how to uh, statistically uh, test and confirm that uh, uh, gamma A and phi A contain inequality inequalities. I, I see the results, and uh, uh, perhaps I don't see the um, uh, the test. And uh, I think that uh, Prof. Naren can can talk, uh, can try to uh, to explain. Uh, to explain me uh, or to explain to the audience uh, how uh, you do uh, uh, all this uh, because I know that uh, under this work there, there are a lot of uh, estimation uh, calculation and uh, it's not appear it's not clear in uh, in, uh, in the presentation in the in the in the PowerPoint perhaps it's uh, it's uh, it's more clear in the paper I don't see the paper but uh, that's my one of my concern and the second is uh, as we see uh, we have uh, uh, effective producer are in the numerator and the effective consumer are in the denominator and uh, uh, I'm, I'm I'm wondering is uh, uh, can we um, the, comp the compensations about uh, these two uh, these two parameters, and uh, I, I will add the third. The third question is about um, uh, uh, has uh, we we know that uh, uh, we when I will take gamma a, uh, it's can uh, it's for uh, for consumption now for um, income income inequalities. Uh, to try to have income equalities, and my question is uh, uh, about endogenities. Is there uh, when we take, um, for example, uh, a, a function like uh, um, the same functions of uh, uh, consumptions? We know that we need to have consumption to uh, to income to consume to consume. Then I, and I, my, my, my question is about the, the relationship uh, ship 
between a uh, link between the gamma and phi uh, in this uh, in this uh, when we try to model to model all this and uh, for suggestion i think that uh, uh, as a uh, um, statistician and econometric econometric and we need uh, uh, to to know if, uh, for example, in the decomposition of gamma A, can we have uh, is is it called effect? Uh, we I I I know that uh, Prof Nana talk about uh, some things uh, like uh, there can be combinations, uh, can be uh, interactions, and um, I, and uh, if we uh, can more uh, uh, explain, it will be. Uh, helpful for for me and also for I think for the audience and uh, also we can we uh, we are I'm interested to know um, how will will capture will capture will the capture of uh, transition effects for example aging yeah, youth effect and and uh, and this uh, kind kind of uh, um, uh, of things that's for the, for Nana, um work which is very very strong work and uh, I congratulate congratulations for, for, for him and uh, his colleague of the team who work with him and for the, the second paper um, I, I see the, paper, uh, the, the presentation is the representative of, uh, of sustainability and equity in Australian international economy and uh, which also is uh, uh, I, I know as as model that is a big 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 work that uh, uh, James Rice and his, his uh, all his colleagues are doing is uh, very very interesting is uh, 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 just uh, uh, one one question I, I see that there are a lot of uh, uh, hypothesis and uh, scenario scenario then. Uh, I just want to, um, I see uh, when in the presentation, I see uh, that uh, uh, the, the authors estimate fiscal system, system, sustainability via uh, present value of aggregate consumption between 2010 and 2066, and uh, also present value of aggregate labor income between the 2010 and 2066. And my, now as uh, we have a shock, uh, COVID shock, for, for example, and my my my, I I want to know as a modeler that uh, uh, when we have this uh, this, this shock, which is uh, one of uh, a big shock uh, we, we have in modern economy, uh, how all this work uh, we are doing uh, in classic way, how it's uh, uh, how for example COVID nineteen shock can change uh, and all his externalities uh, can change the, the, the structure of uh, uh, the shape of consumption, consumption or labor income. And how, uh, as uh, you know, um, um, uh, Australian economy and uh, social norms in, in Australia, how do they, do, do they envision the future of Australia based on the, 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 the the, the result of the, 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 the modeling results. Uh, and also I see that in the results, that uh, the results uh, uh, perhaps I don't understand well, but I see that uh, they are the, the same result for high tech quality and uh, high life expectancy. And uh, it's like, uh, um, uh, I don't, uh, I, I, I want that uh, uh, James and his team uh, uh, try to more explain uh, how they can explain this result for uh, for Australia. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Latif Ramani, for your comments, and I think also keeping the time. I now like to invite uh, Maria Elena Rivera. She is an economist at UNDP El Salvador. And also she has been with the NTA uh, network from 2011 and her field of uh, expertise is uh, she has been working on the areas of uh, social protection demographic and also with a focus, focus on uh, pension. Uh, I'd like to now uh, invite Maria to uh, present her uh, comments. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. 
Thank you. I, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, but I will uh, try to give my comment. First, I want to thank for the idea of the invitation. In time, we on the forum just to engage in activities mostly with Latin American groups. So I'm not very familiar just to hear from comfort from the, the analysis of, of, of different countries. I know that it's not uh, related to the topic of the session, but I want to comment this over the table uh, because NTA and NTPA give us that tremendous advantage uh, to learn from other countries and from different regions. And right now we're facing similar challenges due to COVID-19, but have different perspectives and different approach to solution uh, the same kind of problems. So that's a, 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 very, a very good thing that uh, this network is. Inequality is a central issue on the development agenda, uh, it's uh, SDG number uh, 10, and all the analysis in this session presented enormous contribution not only to understand it, but to decrease it. And congrats to the panelists for their excellent study. Uh, either we talk about income inequality or wealth inequality, which is even more accentuated in ge the general evidence from numerous studies uh, have shown up a uh, trace in income and wealth is increasing. Therefore, the assumption that economic growth will generate equality does not sense, sense. It has not been fulfilled in uh, all the papers presented goes in this line, showing different effects uh, and direction of the effects of uh, economic growth and inequality. In this, sense, it's very, in this sense, it's very interesting the approach of Professor Naya, Narayana that considers that inequality affects economic growth, but uh, it has not uh, considered vice versa, that economic growth affects inequality. But when we see the findings of uh, Professor Rice model uh, in a different way, so I think the complement uh, they set out all the papers presented in this uh, session set out a research agenda right for MTA and inequality because they present different relations and different relations of economic growth and inequality with an MTA uh, framework and also there are countries in different stage of demographic transition and with different uh, context and characteristics. Well, uh, an important contribution uh, that allow us uh, to deepen in the study of the inequality is working beyond average, right? Uh, recognizing the difference of those groups left behind, like in the case of India and elder, elderly consumption, this is a reality for many developing countries with poor social protection regimes and Indonesia and other uh, population in the young one show us how uh, social protection programs not only address poverty, but to re but reduce inequality, even if the mechanism uh, identify and select uh, uh, to identify and select the beneficiaries uh, can be improved. So um, in the case of Indonesia, I would like if, um, Professor Maliki could explain more about those impacts and in inequality or how uh, does he plan to, to study in the future. Also in India, it's dramatic how the labor, incre labor income decreases in working ages when it's adjusted uh, for inequality. And that gives us a powerful message that emphasizes the failures of the current model that perpetrates intergenerational poverty and limit social mobility. Seeing this fact, I would like to ask Professor Narayana if he has considered or model the impact of, of a basic income, but focalized to those whose salary or earnings are below a certain threshold or like minimum wage and what are the impact that it could have to improve uh, the quality in, in income, right? 
Uh, but as I said before, um, social protection will not be enough to achieve SDGs, right? We need a deeper reforms in, in our development model. Uh, a greener economy is needed to build a more equal society in the present and in the future. And it requires certainly for uh, uh, the realization of the full potential of demographic dividend, as well the timing of the SDGs. So if social protection is not enough, fiscal policy is a key element that which must be progressive, helping to reduce inequalities produced by market and the structural aspects that we have. And as Claudia case show us important lessons about fiscal sustainability, where different demographic scenarios result in less fiscal sustainability with the effects of over migration. It's interesting how only economic growth affects intergenerational inequality, but I, uh, I understand well in that way. So if Professor Wright can explain more about this finding, it will be very interesting. And I would like to ask Professor Wright if uh, you have considered to introduce in your scenarios variables such as fiscal policy measures and estimated effects over intergenerational inequality uh, to, to, uh, to learn more about how are the effects of it. That will be it, and thank you very much. Thank you, Maria, for your uh, comments and also uh, uh, insightful thoughts on some of the issues that also uh, are in our mind also in terms of fiscal uh, policy and other transfer issues. Uh, I think we are, I, I'm pretty sure we're over by 10 minutes now, but uh, I think I, I, I'm allowed to go over for another 15 minutes and I'd like to take this opportunity to open, uh, open uh, to take some questions. Maybe we can take uh, three to five questions um, and for for the presenter. So I think uh, if you if you uh, want to ask any question, you can do that. Thank you. Can I say, so I, I know it's already late. I, uh, I just say something really quick about Maliki's presentations. And I think all of the presentations were really, really interesting. I'm very interested in the concept of inequality and poverty. So uh, for Maliki's presentation, I think if he could do uh, a new dimension, like if he looks uh, can look at that data by gender, it would be really interesting. I know we necessarily don't have data on based on gender, like NPA data based on gender. If, but if he could find a way, it would be really interesting. Uh, and particularly, it's interesting for Indonesia because uh, when I wrote my dissertation under supervision of Professor Mason and Professor Sonia Lee, I noticed that uh, like in Indonesia, uh, for elementary school, the school enrollment and school participation is more similar based on gender and when uh, the students go to high school, junior high school and senior high school, the gap gets bigger. And I have a hypothesis, which I haven't tested yet. And my hypothesis is that in the rural area, uh, they don't have high school. Uh, and then um, they send both their, uh, like both boys and girls to a school in, in elementary school. But when it comes to high school, the parents prefer the boys only and they don't send girls to more remote, I mean, to uh, a city or somewhere far away for education. So uh, I think that makes it really interesting. And it could be, it could really vary by um, rural and urban area and by poor and rich. Yeah, thank you. And I like to, I mean, like give uh, one minute to all three presenters to just, um, uh, final words, something like that. I will start with Professor Narayana. For that, uh, Dr. Atif has given two comments. One is the confirmation of the presence of inequalities in consumption and income distribution by statistical tests. Yes, we have also constructed the confidence interval and standard errors have been calculated for both inequalities and they are well within the 95% uh, confidence interval. So it is confirmed that the results are statistically valid. The second one is about the uh, compensation of the inequality affected 
income distribution and consumption distribution. Since I am taking the ratio, I presume that implicitly such compensations are, are, are offset or calculated. Now I take the suggestions forward for my revision of the paper later in terms of cohort analysis. And, and now uh, Maria has given a very important uh, suggestion that when I see the profiles, be it uh, consumption profile or income profile, being different between adjusted and unadjusted for inequality, a lasting lot of stories are present there. A lot of factors go into that, including poverty alleviation and inequality reduction. This paper has not focused on capturing the marginal effect of different sources of income inequality and consumption inequality. I take that suggestion as a way of taking this paper for further extension. Dr. Sanyop also has raised a question whether we are just ending up in giving weights for income inequality and consumption inequality when we are adjusting the economic support ratio accordingly. No, I think it is different because I am calculating the distributional property separately. When I, when I take the distribution, uh, for one, once I take the data for calculation of the profiles in the NPA, but I am taking the distributional properties of the income and consumption separately. And what I see now after the discussion is that I think the benchmark case is the, is the inequality adjusted profiles. Now, as inequalities are, uh, are removed or reduced, how we can progressively increase the growth? I think that gap is actually the, actually the reward that we get for reducing the, of the inequality and also the reward for accomplishing the object of UN Sustainable Development Goal, goal number 10. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Um, I understand. And uh, James, I mean, do you like to respond? Uh, yeah, sure. Um... What did I say? I just I guess I'll make a few uh, just a couple of quick comments. Um, firstly, on uh, uh, how will uh, this be impacted by COVID nineteen? Well, I mean that's a very very uh, irrelevant uh, and interesting question. And uh, obviously, in the short term, uh, labour income profiles have been changing hugely, as have consumption labor profiles. <laughs> so for labour income. You know, in the short term, in Australia, probably in most places, it's been declining. Labour income has been declining a lot for uh, older, older Australians, and also especially for younger Australians. Also, there's been there's been a, a substantial declines in labour income amongst uh, female workers. So, obviously, this will have an effect now. What how what the impact will be in the next uh, forty or fifty years? I mean. Yeah, who knows? I mean, it's important, but it is important to get your um, your economic scenarios uh, accurate, you know, right in some sense. Um, I should also mention, yeah, for consumption, a lot of the consumption is moving from being sourced from the market into the household. And so outside of the standard uh, non-NTTA national accounts, so uh, tran national transfer accounts. So that's also an important uh, development. Um, so yeah, so I guess my point is, uh, yes, these will have huge impacts and exact I need to think about exactly uh, how that will be and get uh, maybe uh, look at some different scenarios. Uh, now, finally, on to uh, um, the impact of high fertility and high life expectancy on things like the consumption deficit. Just mention that, uh, I mean, it's true the the overall impacts seem similar, but uh, obviously they are probably operating at different uh, ends of the age distribution. So um, high fertility probably operates through uh, increasing the numbers of uh, young people who are, uh, whose life cycle, who have a life cycle deficit, whereas high life expectancy may have the same overall effect, but it operates through older people who are also have a life cycle deficit. So, I mean, there's overall results might be similar, but there are, a, you know, do, there are different mechanisms. I think that's all the comments I made. Unfortunately, I, uh, my internet was playing up, so I didn't quite get uh, Maria's questions. But, uh, okay. Yes, uh, thanks for yeah. those. Thanks for your session. I think this session has been a very good session with very, three very interesting paper with, with comments from our designated discussions were also very relevant. I think participants were, were very good. And I think I'd like to just uh, conclude with thanking our East West Center uh, colleagues, like in particular, Mary, Justina and Penny for their hard work and patience. They have been, I mean, almost with us from the morning 
to end and also to professor uh, andrew Mason. i have I, I have seen his also uh, listening uh, to this presentation and also saying up with that i like to thank you all and hand over to sang uh, sang here for the final comments and if any thank you